If you subscribe to my channel, then you have probably seen the sea trial videos that I made about the Vigo C10, as well as the Vigo C8. During a recent visit to Vigo HQ in Sweden, I had the opportunity to take a look around their facilities, where Vigo build their rugged all-season powerboats. Despite only having one microphone, I thought that I would bring you, my subscribers, along as I explore Vigo's impressive facilities. And if you'd like to see the videos that I made about the C10 and the C8, then head to the link in the video description. Of course, the main reason I traveled to Sweden was to bring you an exclusive first look at their brand new 100% electric C11. This exciting boat tour video will be coming soon to my channel. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it. We have Simon, who is Vigo's representative uh, in the UK, and also we have uh, Douglas as well from Vigo. So thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, let's have a look around and basically see what we can find, starting with this. So this is a C18 build, right? C10. Oh, C10. This is C10. Oh, yes. It is, it is a C10, and Douglas has just told me that this particular boat is going to the UK. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And how long is... before this one's finished? How long, Douglas, do you reckon until this one's done? Uh, it, it's actually done in this compartment now. Um, so we will move it uh, in a couple of days, and then the rest of the work is taken part. And how long has it taken to get to this stage? that we see now, how long does this take? It's around 1300 hours. About 1300 hours. And how many people would you have working on that? They are, they are doing a different part of the boat. So it's, I can say every people that's working in here are involved in it uh, for the different work. Yeah, and I think it's something that people will find fascinating is this is obviously built by hand, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, no, yeah. No, no. there's no machines no. in here. There's literally, no. you, you walked in here. It's hand built. Yeah, you wouldn't know. Boat. You wouldn't no. know it's a boat no. all being shed other than the fact it's got the boats <laughs> in it. So something that I sort of noticed straight away on that hull is, is the spray rails on that. They're really kind of deep spray rails, right? Yes, yes. And are they that depth for a particular reason? Or do you find that in terms of the, the hull efficiency and the dynamics of the hull, that's what works best for the C10? Exactly. You, you need to find the width of the spray list that you feel that is good for the boat. Uh, if you go too wide, it will more break than mm -hmm. it will give you a lift that you want to have with the rails. If it's too narrow, you will get less lift. So it's, it's the whole thing about the design, how you want to use the boat. And on this C10, what um, outboards is it going to have uh, fitted on this one? Yes, this boat will have the 400 V10s on Mercury. Yeah. Is that the biggest you can get on this one? Is it on the C10? You can have the 500 R from Mercury also. Twin 500 R's? Yes. Yeah. Wow. And what kind of top speed you'll be looking at with that? Around 65 knots. 65 knots. So, Simon, we recently it's, it. It's, uh, too good. it's too nice to get wet, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always notice that uh, viewers mention when it comes to aluminium boats is the finish. Some people think you should paint it, yeah. other people think that you should leave it as it is. What, as the builder, what would you recommend and what do you think the benefits are of each? Uh, our point is that you should leave it as it is. Leave uh, it as it is. Then you will get this maintenance free product that m most people are searching for. Yeah. Uh, if you start to paint it, it we look nice, of yeah. course, but you are back to the maintenance part again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Simon, in terms of uh, you own a C8 uh, back in the UK, what do you find the benefits are in terms of having an aluminium boat like this over a traditional GRP boat? Yeah, f for me it had to be towable. That was the critical thing for me. Yeah. Um, so our C8 is 1.9 tons with the engine. So. By the time you put a bit of fuel in it and a trailer, you're still under the three ton mark. So, you know, any decent four wheel drive can tow it. Yeah. And it's actually lighter than ribs, a lot of ribs of the same size, which is yeah. when you look at a boat like this, you think it's going to be really heavy, but it's, um, they're unbelievably light. So they've, that for us, it was, t it needed to be towable. Um, but also the fact that you can just, you, you don't, not abuse them is the wrong word, but 
you can just drive them up a beach. Yeah. You can be a little bit um, careless around a few rocky beaches and you're not going to really do it any harm. Yeah. Whereas a fiberglass or GRP, you know, if you, if you ding a rock at low speed, you can just slightly shatter it. That's what we talked uh, about earlier on. You yeah. Have a picture of a, of a Vigo that hits a rock doing what sort of speed? The, that was going over 30, over 30 knots and it hits a, it hits a, a, a submerged rock in the archipelago and it basically put a, a dent in the hull. Yeah. Which, which they, they, the boat was drivable after that. And if that had been a fiberglass boat, it would have just at least put a hole in it. When you Probably showed me worse. that picture, yeah, I was yeah. absolutely amazed. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the impact. Yeah. Like you said, if that would have been a traditional GRP yeah. boat, it would have just smashed the pieces. And I think the guy drove it, carried on driving. He managed to lift the um, engine leg at the very last minute and just, he, he clipped a propeller, yeah. one of the props, but it, it was still drivable. That's yeah, which is just in terms of craftsmanship. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not a welder. I don't know nothing about welding. But you look at like the beads on this and the finish on it. It's just unbelievable. I know. I think I th I'm not a welder either. But people who tell me about aluminium welding, it's very very skilled. Yeah. Uh, very skilled stuff. And I don't know if we can see over there. There's a a C10 on the jig. So that's its early stages. So obviously they all start off as flat pieces of aluminium. Yeah. They get cut out with um, laser cutters and then they go onto the jig for welding. And then, uh, as Douglas said, whatever it was, a thousand odd hours later, this is what you get. Isn't that unbelievable though, when you think about it, you know, you strip it back and over there, like you say, you've got the plate, plates, the aluminium plates, and then literally a thousand man hours later, you've got this. And it's just incredible. I, th I have a feeling also that when in the summer the jigs, because the jigs are metal, I think they themselves expand slightly, so they have to adjust the jig to compensate for the uh, the temperature in in here. But just looking at it like that, and to think that you know in in, in a few months, because the build time of a C10, it's roughly me, six months. Yeah, I mean, that is unbelievable. That in six months you can go from essentially. You know, the sheets of aluminium over there, to that in the jig, like you were saying, to that. It's, it's to me, whenever you look at it, you just, oh, this is quite interesting, because you can see into it now. And you can see where, where all the sort of strengthening braces and struts are. The string is in there. Yeah, yeah, the game, look at that metal work, it's unbelievable. And Douglas, one question we always get asked is, how thick is the aluminium? <laughs> yeah, it's depending, it's various on the boat. But for example, you see 10 is five millimeters in the bottom uh, and the hull side is four millimeters. And then the transom is, is 10 and then the, the stringers, <coughs> the longitude the, on the side is a uh, combination between 10 and eight also. And on the C8, is that the same? It's nearly the same, but then the, the hull is only four. The C10 needs to be five. So there's, it's a myth. When someone says, oh, you want really thick aluminium hulled boats, it's a complete myth. You want actually to be as light as possible, but you get the yeah. strength by being very clever on how you design yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The construction with the, with the longitudinal uh, stiffeners. And if someone's interested in uh, commissioning the build of a C10, what the price the starting price. I think Simon's better on the. Uh, in round there. numbers, around four hundred and fifty thousand sterling for yeah, a yeah. C10, two engines. Yeah. You can spec it up to be around five hundred and fifty if you tick all the boxes, but yeah. they come really well equipped as standard. Actually, most people don't need to, you know, in the UK put air conditioning oh. and things like that on it, but um, you can do if you wanted to. Yeah. Or you can have the whole thing painted, but as we said earlier. Don't really need to, um, but yeah, around about five, four fifty to five hundred thousand pounds for a C10. Yeah, and the build time six months. About six months, yeah. And Douglas, how many um, how many boats are you building here on an average year? Would you say around twenty, twenty-five? About twenty-five. Yeah. And how, and how many of those are C10s? Uh, four to five, I should yeah. say. So four to five C10s a year. So where do you get your aluminium from? Where, where do you sort of buy the aluminium from? Um, it's a 
Swedish brand that we buy it from. Oh, okay. um, for the and beginning, I think it's. And it's recycled, so when the boat comes to the end of its life, the aluminium is recyclable. Is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and I'm guessing it's been recycled already. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, probably. It's probably recycled <laughs> yeah. and recyclable, which is, which is becoming quite a big talking point in boats now. Yeah, yeah, yeah end yeah. of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I, I guess we don't know what the life span of one of these boats is because no, they're, no. they're still going yeah exactly, exactly. Uh, now i think the hull will probably have i don't know 20 25 years without any problem then maybe you need to check other things of the boat uh, like uh, in turn uh, the structure itself will probably hold for a lifetime uh, it's good to know there's gonna be another c10 in the uk though yeah. What about the new case this one going to? I believe this one's going up to Scotland. Scotland, yeah. yeah great place for it. Yeah. Place for it. Perfect, perfect Vigo territory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it really is a real honour to see it in, uh, in this state of build, really. So, over here on the left, what happens over on this part of the factory? This is. Uh the part that is standing there is uh, actually the, the floor plate for inside of the C10. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are pre-doing some work on uh, some of the parts before we are lifting in, into the boat uh, because it's easier and then we can control it better if we do it on the side instead of lying in the boat. Yeah. And, uh, and that big machine angle. over there, big blue machine, is that a cutting machine? Is that a cut the aluminium? That's a bent machine. Oh, so bent that we have in the beginning. Ah, uh, but it's an older right. one, uh, so it's a, a spare machine. So. One of the things that we were saying actually when we came in is just how warm it is in here, considering how freezing it is outside. It's a proper blizzard. <laughs> yeah. Hence, yeah. I've still got my hat on. I can take that off. I think I might have to start the crowdfunding page <laughs> for my own C10. If anyone's interested in chipping in a few quid, <laughs> we'll make some good content going yeah. out in the rough stuff. Yeah. Excellent. So, where should we bimble to now? Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah, we'll follow you. No, I just I, I just find it fascinating. Simon, have you seen you can... a boat at this stage of build yet? No, I've seen I've seen them in uh, the sort of fully welded stage yeah. and I've seen the jig but I haven't been here whilst they're physically putting the sheet metal on yeah uh, and and sort of tack welding it up it's I'm sure it's some, one of those skills that they make look very easy it's just amazing to me that it's still done by hand that it's not like there's not loads of robots in here yeah I, I think like you I see think, in the car factories yeah You've got 15 robots all doing a certain bit of the building. I think they need time. to sort of feel what's going on. Yeah. Um, which a robot can't do. Yeah. Pilot. We do love a pilot boat on this channel. Yeah, for fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. You see over there when we have the Vigo logo, you yeah. see that the hand rail is going down like this. That was because the boats that we're building here in the 80s, the bow of the boat goes up there. Really? Wow. Uh, okay, so the bow was the bow was that high on there, the that commercial the, boats they used to build a hatch here. In the roof over there. Yeah. So they took a crane from outside to get the engines in the boat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> then you can realize how it That's a big old boat. Big yeah, boat inside yeah. here back in the days. <laughs> so all this uh, facilities is made for building boats of that size. Uh, so we are just posting those. We should have. We can. If it has been half the height, we're happy. Yeah, also. yeah. So we so we are building kind of small boats. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Right, wow, let's head next door. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, look at this. Here you have some <laughs> some wow. re some real boats. <laughs> well, this is I mean this is the first time I've been in here. So what we we're, we're seeing now I've not seen before. But look at this. So as well as building the aluminium Vigo boats, this shipyard 
builds and maintains other other boats, obviously. What we're seeing here now, is that all been built here? No, 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 no. Right. <clears throat> These are just boats we're making in services on. So this is a boat you service right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one I really like. It's funny because back in the UK, orange normally denotes search and rescue, right? But the pilot boats out here are all, all orange, main, yeah, yeah. most of them are orange. Yeah, sure. yeah. So it's a work boat, it goes out picking up the um, garbage, the trash out of the water. Yeah. So here you have the same. That's another brand, but you still have the fins also. Oh, okay. You get a really good shot, side profile shot of that pilot boat. Those signs, those searchlights up there as well. One thing is, everyone just has quite serious boats out here, don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is the one, yeah. we have the last one. So that is the X8, is that what it's on? X8, yeah. Getting its, getting its bottom painted. Quick check, here we have also the other thing, but this is the dry dock. It's, it's a pretty cool thing to see the boats down there when we are still inside. <laughs> wow. Yeah, look at this. I don't know, it's maybe not so much material for the Vigo boats, but it's, it's funny to see yeah. it just. I love that, I think it's the first dry dock I've been in where the actual rock, yeah. you, you can see yeah, the bare face rock. Away. Yeah, yeah. I think every dry dock I've been in is obviously like a purpose-built yeah, yeah, dry dock, but the no. fact you've got the... Um, this this was there. flat from the beginning, the whole way down to the water, and they took the boats up and uh, on lorries or trails, uh, and then drove it inside there, and at some point they blew this up. So what's this boat having done to it at the moment? What's changing the... engines. They're actually changing the engines? There you see the old ones. Ah. So they're making three brand new engines with uh, uh, like an after treatment system for the exhaust. Yeah. Um, and then they are doing the rudders and they are fixing the propellers and shafts and all that. So it's a pretty big job. So it's been here for two months soon, I think. Been here two months. How long before it's, um, the job's finished on this one? I don't know, actually. <laughs> the, the, they should, like, the plan from the beginning was before the winter, but when you pick one of these boats up, it always comes, oh, you can do this, you can yeah, do this, yeah. and this. So it's Find other jobs more, to do. Yeah, exactly. So we will see. Yeah, very impressive building, very impressive. What's the biggest size boat you can have in here? It's 46 meters long, 15 meter wide. No, is that the C8? Or is that a Looks like three, four C8s, an X8 and a C10. Oh, well, there you go. So what, yeah, I was going to say, one question we get asked a lot is why, why do some boats have bigger trim tabs than others? These are particularly big trim tabs. And you see other boats that are that are made with, with, with no trim tabs or just tiny little bits of tin, effectively, that look like trim tabs. So Douglas, what's the thinking behind trim tabs? Um, we want to have big trim tabs so we can put a high pressure on the bow and really use that when you get out in the rough weather. Uh, so, so putting the bow down into the sea to, to soften the ride, basically. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to bounce around and jump with the, with the bow up in the air. You want to keep the bow as much in the water as possible yeah. to have a more comfortable ride. So, so if you're going into a nasty head sea, you trim the engine right down yeah. and then you use these in addition to the engine. Yeah, exactly. To gain even yeah, more pressure. Yeah, even more bow pressure down. Exactly. And then also when you're running across a beam sea, you can tilt the boat, the boat sideways yeah, exactly. by putting one exactly. of the tabs down so that effectively the boat was always landing on its deep V to soften the landing exactly. so it's not landing on the side. Precisely. Yeah, it's a, re it's a real, and for me as a lucky owner of one of these C8s, it's the, the trim tabs are on stalks like on um, 
sort of where you'd have your windscreen wipers on a car. So you 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 keep your hands on the wheel, yeah. and it's, you just little flicks of the levers just just tilts the uh, the angle of the boat, the pitch of the boat, and it's it's they're they're really good fun to drive. It's very these intuitive, boats. And yeah. I think that's the thing that when we when I joined you, Simon, out on the sea trial of um, the eight and the ten, you know, getting a feel for how the shoot yeah. tabs worked, getting a feel for how the boat performs in the choppy weather that we experienced. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't particularly rough, but it was choppy. But the, the yeah. way the boat handled and the way that the bow was just set into the way. Yeah. So you're skimming over. It's just really, really impressive. And you're going, you're going a lot faster than you think. Yeah. You know, there's, there's. You look down and think, God, I'm going, you know, nigh on 50 knots. I mean, depending on what engine you have on these, these will go nearly 70 knots. Is that right, Douglas? If you at least 60 something. It's around, yeah, it's around 60 with this 400 V10 yeah. engine. Yeah. Having 60 at the top. So you, the, the engine choices are typically 300, 400 or 500, yeah, depending on uh, how thirsty you want them to be. <laughs> and, the, and the starting price for the C8? In round numbers, they are about £150,000. Which so. is, you know, from my own personal opinion, is really well priced for how much boat you're getting, build quality, uh, and everything else. And the build time on the C8 is roughly the same as the C10, do you think? Six months? Uh, maybe around that. It's depending uh, over, the, over the year. Yeah, yeah. And the next row, we've got the C8 that's having the lights fitted. Oh, that is just for working. So you can see ah, what they're doing in the boat. It's right, just okay. Christmas lights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So these two CAs, are they staying in Sweden, are they? Or are yes. they? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is Swedish customers. You can tell this one is because you don't get many UK boats with a stern anchor. A stern anchor one, yeah. Um, I, I love stern anchors. I think I I have one on my boat. I didn't spec one on my boat. I've got a bow anchor, but. To have, you think you get much use of it in the UK? I think, I think to be able to anchor, it's, you can always just throw over an anchor yeah. off the back but as a secondary anchor, but I think to be able to position the boat head to wind, uh, it, it's, always, it's always going to be head to wind with a bow anchor, but to position a boat so you, you can have it pointing any direction you like yeah. um, is, is quite a nice thing to do. Um, or if you're nudging, we often park our boat up on it we just go straight up onto the sort of shingle beaches just bow on yeah and of course then you've you've got to use the engine to drag yourself off but you could also use a stern anchor on a windlass and just pull yourself back off the beach yeah um yeah you don't see it very often over in the uk but it's quite a nice thing yeah Guys, I've been trying to convince uh, Simon to lend me his C8 uh, for a few months. So if you think he should, let, let him know in the comments. The more comments I get, the more chance I've got of getting it for a few months. You're very welcome. <laughs> so if this you, was going to be your C8, well, how would you spec this one, Simon? If this was going to be well, it depends if I was going to lend it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd put a five horsepower outboard on it for you. Yeah. With a 15 litre yeah. fuel tank. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, it's and again it's a good question how how I would spec a, set, a, a boat having had one for roughly three years now yeah, what I would, would, change I, would about yours? I wouldn't change much I think I would put a windless anchor on the bow as opposed to just throwing the anchor over the bow yeah purely because it, I'd quite often take the boat out on my own and if you're then anchored on your own to pull the anchor up it's very easy to pull the anchor up, but if the if it's windy and horrible and tidy, you you you're, you're moving. As soon as the anchor's off the bottom, you're moving. Yeah. So everything's a bit of a sort of rush job to get the anchor away before you potentially drift onto another boat. So yeah. I would I would put a windlass on the bow. Um, I wouldn't change much else. I'd stick with the 300 outboard. I think it's just a nice combination of power to economy. Yeah. Um, have you used yours much as a weekender to stay on overnight? Have you? Your C8? Yeah, we have. Um, we uh, That's probably another thing I would do. I would take the sort of bed option on it. Yeah. Um, we tend to sort of, uh, the two of us, my son and I, often just go out and sort of camp on it. So one's lying across the seats across the back. 
and another one's effectively lying in the floor. It's definitely camping, but you can, uh, from Vigo, they, they have infills to make it into a double bed, and uh, I right. think I'd probably do that. And then the little infills live in this bow locker, so it's, it's something we had on the C10 when we had a C10 in the UK yeah. last year, and it was, we, yeah, we took the boat you know, down to Cornwall and Devon and slept on it. In fact, three of us and the dog slept on it, and, and it was dog. fantastic. <laughs> Um, did but you it's, the dog it, have a go of filming the boat? Did you? Did you have a go? It's be better than me. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting how you can see how basically how wide the cabin is, yeah. because it's a walk through boat. Yeah. It, whereas a lot of boats are walk around boats, so you lose a lot of space. Yeah. Um, it's the, the whole boat is 2.3 meters wide, and most of that is cabin. Yeah. And, and you you know with with a walkthrough boat you also get a nice big cockpit area so for a relatively small boat of 8.2 meters you, you get, get a, a lot of you get a lot of space yeah. um, so this this bow area is just fantastic you know if you want to have room to take wetsuits on and off or just sit down and you know you've obviously got cushions that go everywhere and you can put a table on the floor and just sit down and have a picnic out here have you got a table on your one yeah we have oh, yeah okay. which you can put inside as well yeah um, and then on the C10, this whole area can be infilled with a big sun pad as well if you wanted yeah. it to. Um, in terms of your C8, what's, what's the kind of worst conditions you've taken it out in? Probably shouldn't say that in front of <laughs> in front of Douglas, but the Fastnet race, the start of the Fastnet race this year and the previous Fastnet race were proper wind against tide in the Solent. You've yeah. only got to Google it and you'll see how rough it was in the Solent and out towards the Needles. And uh, we were out in ours. And then this year there was a chap in Cows who's got one and he was out this year in his. Yeah. And um, there weren't, put it this way, there weren't many boats out at that point. Um, and then I can just remember seeing on the TV, Mark in his was just out, you know, where probably he shouldn't have been <laughs> and uh, was having a great time. Yeah. They, they definitely punch above their weight. Yeah. Um, and there's, just, there's something very clever about the, the hull design that makes it very difficult to stuff the bow. Even if you're trying, it, the bow just doesn't seem to dig in. Um, what do you think the reason behind it is? Oh, you'd have to ask the, the designer, but yeah. it's a light boat. And it's, it's at, despite the very pointy, sharp bow, there's quite a lot of volume around here. Yeah. So, um, it just seems to lift quite nice. It's just balanced really nicely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you even in the short chop of places like the Solent, it just, it just you just think, well, this okay, it's going to go in, it's going to go in, you're going to nose dive, and it yeah. just doesn't seem to do it. Um, and the only time it does do it is if you're facing a nasty head sea and you're just literally going walking speed yeah. because obviously the bow will just the waves will just break over that top bit of the bow but it's fine it can deal with it but as soon as you get a bit of throttle on the bow lifts up a bit it, you just hop over it so when the if, if, if you do get a lot of water coming over the bow for whatever reason in terms of where does the water go How yeah there's big off? there's big scuppers you can see the scuppers on both sides of the boat so it does it does uh, drain the water very quickly yeah. and we had an incident off uh Alderney in one of the tidal races off Alderney heading down to Guernsey and um, we were in a, a bit of tidal race in bad weather where we, again where we probably shouldn't have been a bit overconfident we had a, a, a fairly big wave over the bow in a really messy bit of tide yeah. and um, the water sort of came over the bow up the front door and slightly over the roof but the boat was just it just dealt with it water yeah. drained very quickly and we didn't really slow down so it's a very confidence-inspiring boat, even in pretty nasty conditions. Is the any idea how thick the glass is on the on the boat? I don't know actually. How thick's the glass, Douglas? Thick enough. Thick, thick enough. Six yeah. millimeters. That's six millimeters. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's six millimeters of glass. It's going to take some take some force, right? Yeah. Uh, he, this is quite a good example of the X8, how obviously the windscreen's raked back instead yeah. of raked forward. Yeah. It's just a more of a classic sort of sports boat look. But you still have a, a fully waterproof um, top and lower section of the, of the door. 
Yeah. So obviously you'd close that when you're underway, but. Um, Any idea how much CX8? It's, just, it's less than the C8. Yeah. Um, again, in round figures, about 130,000 yeah. pounds with a 300. Yeah, so every boat that has a roof has solar panels as standard and they basically keep the uh, house battery topped up. So um, uh, right, okay. you'll, always, you'll always come back to a boat that can start, which is reassuring. Yeah, you're not going to come back and have flat batteries. No. And then the little silver dome uh, circles behind the solar panels are independent solar powered ventilation systems. So any light and they can just turn a fan, if you want to, they can turn a fan to suck air in or out of the boat. So if you're leaving your boat closed up, which people do for months on end, then yeah. you know you don't come back to a damp, a, a, you know, mouldy, damp uh, boat. It's all fresh air. It's yeah. brilliant. I, I leave mine on permanently, basically. Yeah, don't you, yeah. You've got an app as well. You and yours. Yeah. And so you also, yeah, I on. do. I have an app. I have. There's a little black box that uh, you can put on pretty much any boat, but I think it's it, they're, they're good for all boats. Which talks to your phone and it's telling you things like bilge temperature, uh, all your sort of battery status. It's obviously got a GPS receiver in it. It tells you if the bilge is going to be freezing, things like that. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite useful for any boat because if you leave a boat on a swinging mooring and water is somehow getting into your boat, you'll be alerted on your phone before mm -hmm. you go down and find a problem. Is that a standard yeah. thing on the Vigo? It isn't, but it's a it's not expensive. Yeah. And I, I, having used it, I would probably put it on every boat now. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's just a really clever little black box. Yeah, makes sense. Simon, I feel like I'm a vlogger now. I'm walking around with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Don't scream too much, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, okay. So, yeah, Doug, tell us what we've um, got here. What's going on here, basically? Uh, here they are mounting all the equipment, like fuse holders, uh, electronics for the, the stereo and control panel uh, and everything is mounted on a plastic uh, big sheet you can say so we get it isolated from the hull ah right okay yeah, I guess that's the thing is the aluminium hull with lots of electrics doesn't really mix so you have to have that insulation there. yeah every part is isolated from the hull and once the boat is completed we also measure in the hull to see that it's actually stuck right okay have you seen it like this before, Simon? You've seen all this kind of... No, it baffles me, all this part. <laughs> but all I know is all the wiring is waterproof. So even on an X8, you know, the, you can leave the boat out all year round and moisture won't get into the wiring system. Not at all? No, it's, it's literally waterproof. So that's quite it's reassuring. insulated. Yeah. yeah. Check out that wiring. There's a lot of wiring going on there. It always fascinates me how much wiring actually goes into a boat. <laughs> you think of a boat, you think of the engine, you know, and that's pretty much it. But all of this kind of wiring goes into... So this, this particular setup here, is this for the C8 or the yeah. C10? This is the C8. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed having a look around the facility and sorry for only having one microphone. That's something I must sort out ASAP. So I love doing these kind of impromptu walk arounds at some of the boatyards and shipyards that I visit. If you want to make sure that you don't miss the full boat tour video for the C11, then make sure you hit the notification bell when you subscribe to my channel. And if you're looking to charter a boat of any size, any budget anywhere in the world, then head to the link that I'll leave pinned in the comments.